It's episode 17 of the Improv London podcast with this week's guest, Katie Shute. This ain't gonna be easy. Welcome to episode 17. <laughs> I had a great time talking to Katie, um, as I always do, talking to my guests. And um, we, we talked about lots and lots of things, all of the fun things about talking to someone with Katie's experiences that she can mention something like a mono scene. And I go, oh, can you explain what a mono scene is? And uh, of course she's able to do so there. So it's very, uh, it's very instructive, as well as very entertaining, this interview. Uh, we talk about Katie's work with the uh, with Project Two, who have been described as legitimately all right, and uh, we discover why Katie's got such high standards when it comes to improv. Do enjoy. Katie Shute, welcome to the podcast. Yay. Thank Hello. you for coming on. Oh, yeah, I like it already. <laughs> you like it already. Brilliant. Cool. Downhill. Downhill from this point <laughs> onwards, then. Yeah, you can only fuck it up. <laughs> How are you? I'm good, thank you. I've spent my day in Brighton. Brilliant. I've been in Brighton a couple of times this week with May Days. Oh, right, yes. Um, so we've got a writing wing now. It's Ooh. very new, but we're trying to um, get an American style writer's room going. Right. And there's no. The only goal at the moment is to. Find out how we write as a team. Yes. That's it. So that's quite fun. And how do you write as a team? Well, it's only day two. Day two, all right. Early days. So although we've written a handful of sketches already, so that's good. Yeah. yeah. Now we're just messing about with stuff. Yeah, cool. Cool, right, excellent. Yeah. Um, okay, so <laughs> I've, I've, I've thought of a question. Awesome. <laughs> I've thought of a question. This is, this is my question. Okay. I thought of on the walk to Theatre Delicatessen tonight. Mm -hmm. um, and that was, and it's quite a hard question, oh, great. but all the other questions will be easy for <laughs> So if only only if I can get past this one, <laughs> and get to standing fun. Okay, great. Or or I'll just cut this question out. Okay. So uh, <laughs> it's not that hard. I've built it up a bit more than entirely if necessary. Six trains travelling at <laughs> sixty-five miles per hour. Yeah. Because that's what that's what all the improv <laughs> fans out there want to know about. Maths. I mean, she seems pretty good at improv, but how's her maths? <laughs> how's her mental arithmetic? Yeah. Okay, so yeah. it's not that, but that's a good one. I'll save that for next time. Okay, um, okay so in the Chris Mead episode yeah, of the I've Improv London to. podcast, which you have listened to, yeah. <laughs> which maybe we'll discuss. <laughs> maybe you have a few issues with. <laughs> um, uh, he described how when Steve Rowe had people in Steve's Rowe's drop in, yeah. uh, Steve could tell who had taught. Which, which person? Yeah. And I asked Chris how what um, the people he taught came across that. he was as. like, they're all amazing. Was that his answer about his students? Yeah. <laughs> and and there, was, there, was a, there was a bit more jumping around and being enthusiastic right. and that sort of stuff. Yeah. The best ones were Chris's. Do you think Chris, so? No, that's what I think Chris said. Oh, that's really what Chris said. <laughs> okay, so yeah. um, if you... If you were to imagine, or maybe Steve's told you, if you were to mm -hmm. imagine what Steve was to tell you, how would somebody know? <laughs> I think the complicatedness of this question is just me getting it all out. Um, how would somebody know if they'd been taught by Katie Hughes? How would you characterise someone that I've brainwashed is sort of the question, isn't That's it? a much better way okay. of putting it. <laughs> <laughs> well, Maria said something to me, off the record, I guess, so maybe I shouldn't say it, but anyway... She said it was interesting because we all inherit each other's students, as, as I'm sure Chris said. So sometimes I'll teach the beginners and then um, Maria or Chris or any of the other Hoopla teachers will get them next. And there is that, and I think we all get a sense of that. But um, she said, I, did you teach these people? And I said, yes. <laughs> and she, so it's not a Steve thing, but it's a Maria thing. And she oh, said, right. oh, because they're all, they're all fearless. Right. So they'll kind of add offers and not worry about what happens with them. So I hope that's true. I definitely try and instill people with a sort of blind trust. Right. I'm not too bothered about, I mean, it depends what sort of improv, but I'm not too bothered about if you have a thing, like you have a plan or a premise or whatever, unless you're doing a very premisey show. But uh, yeah, I just want people to show up and be there for the other person. And yeah. you know, if someone shows up on stage, uh, for them to be able to trust the people they play with to also show up and then create something with them. <laughs> <laughs> so I guess it's that really that people will just throw themselves into it. 
before before they have an idea, or if they do, that's fine, but they better be ready to drop it if it, you know, isn't happening in that moment, you know. Because I've, I've always found that if I wait for an idea, I don't ever get on stage, so... Yeah, well, I think I'm maybe the same. I need to get on early in a show, yeah. otherwise I end up watching the show and yes. going, aren't these people very clever? Well, I could never do that. But if you're in the first scene or the first couple scenes, you're like, I'm in it, this is cool, I'm on a ride. That's exactly my approach, especially yeah. with the jam. Um, I, I get, try and get on in the first scene, because then if I don't do anything else, at least I was in the first scene. Yeah. Uh, at least I've done something, but having been in it, I'm more likely to then step up and do something else again. Yeah, so. and people bring you back as well yes. if they want to see that character or whatever. So you're, you've kind of thrown your, thrown your chips in, haven't you? Yes. Like, all right, I'm in the show now. What else do you want? <laughs> um, yeah, and it stops you. Well, it doesn't stop you, but it helps with getting in your head, doesn't it? It reduces the amount of getting in your head. And I say that to students as well. If they're quite new or they just have to be nervous, or even to myself if I'm somewhere taking a class, um, that the longer you sit there, even in a class, the more you're going to worry about it. Yes. You're going to look at the other scenes and go, oh, they're really good. I'm going to look terrible following them or... You know, whatever. So I think it's a lot of crap that we tell ourselves. So the less time we give our brains to think about what might go horribly wrong, then the easier it's going to be, right? Yes, I, and I definitely find that even we're in classes, um, I will try and do it first or second. Yeah. Uh, because it's harder. The longer you leave it, the harder it gets. Yeah. Because the more of the other people you've seen doing it, you go, <laughs> oh, I couldn't do that. And we're idiots because that's how long it takes to have a good idea, right? So we do all the shit ideas, just pave the way for the people with really good ideas later on in the show. <laughs> we just walk on with a, a brilliant, fully formed idea and we're like, all right, guys, well, we, t- we took the shit for you. So <laughs> you better appreciate it. Oh, I, like to, I like to think that it's, it's a sacrifice we're prepared, <laughs> yeah, we're prepared yeah, we to are. make. We're martyrs. <laughs> So, um, yes, uh, so when you're teaching, yes. when you're teaching, mm-hmm. um, how much do you plan and how much is improvised? Okay, that's a good question. Um, I, I always have a lesson plan uh, and I have sort of generic lesson plans for things that come up a lot or workshops that I've ended up teaching more than once. Uh, or even if I teach a drop-in, I will kind of have a theme and then like a bunch of exercises might fit in. But <laughs> it's rarely ever what I plan, but, which is good, right? Because yeah, yeah. it means like people are different or, or they're more adaptable than I thought or they need a bunch of work on one tiny thing. And I'm like, oh, okay, well, there's no point moving on to that stuff until you guys are really comfortable with this. Or, or it's something really basic about how they communicate or hang out with each other in that environment or... And then you're like, well, there's no point getting heavily into this thing unless this is solved. Um, So, yeah, I would say I I always plan uh, unless there's one thing I often do in like an eight week class, which is doing individual feedback. I don't really I don't do that much in the beginners because Mm. that's I don't want people to be too much out on their own. Uh, But I have with some if they're super confident and they just want to be challenged, Uh, which is just have a yeah an individual feedback week where I won't have a plan at all apart from everyone has like seven to ten minutes. Hmm. And at the beginning we'll talk about like, uh, what's scaring you? Do you think there's anything you want to work on? Um, and then I'll have my own thoughts about that as well. And I'll also ask people, I've started doing this the last couple of years of like, because uh, I'm aware there's different cycles in improv. Sometimes you want to work yourself really hard, yes. yeah? And you want to yes. be challenged and you want to take bigger risks and you're, you're quite resilient. And other times you feel like if you do something crap, you'll just cry. Yes. <laughs> so I try and check in with people also of like, do you want something who challenges you? Or do you just want to have fun for like 10 minutes? Because yes. if you want that, we'll just do that. Because that's really important too. And you can just do all your favorite exercises yes. or whatever makes you happy, you know. Um, so that's really interesting. So you will um, you'll check in with the people yeah. um, and you will... Um, so you'll tell you the exercises to whether they need to be cherished or challenged. Yeah, and that's mostly up to them. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> you know, tiny, tiny percent window. Um, <laughs> but, then our, but then that lesson will be, oh, I have an exercise. I want to do this exercise for you. Um, you know, I need three other people as well, or we'll just work with you on this, or whatever. So that one's always completely up in the air because I can't really make a plan for that. Um, because even if I decided I want to do these exercises for these people, it would be so much stuff and probably irrelevant by the time I got there. Right, you yes. Know, so that one I don't plan at all. Do you ever check in with people as to how much personal feedback they want? I do. Someone said something interesting about that the other week, and I, uh, I can't remember who it was. 
um, which was, it might have been Heather actually, but she said, if someone asks you for feedback, it's generally because they want praise, which is very interesting. And I don't know if that's completely Ooh. true, but now it's a question I ask myself if people do ask me for specific feedback, um, particularly after a course or a show is finished. Yes. And they're like, by the way, going forward, is there anything I should work on? Yes. And now I question, are you someone that just needs some love? Like you just need, you know what? You're brilliant at these things. Yes. Just concentrate on them and have a really fun time. Yes. Or if it's someone who's genuinely going, look, I really want to push myself. Yeah. yeah, yeah. Because I think there's a sort of weird duty of care in improv as well that you need to, if people are feeling super unconfident with their work, their work is going to suffer. Yes. So there have to be points where we're just looking after people with egos, I think, which is fine. I don't have a problem with that. Yes. Um, and that's really interesting. Um, because I, I, well, as you say, I have those times when I'm feeling, you know, super confident and I'd like every, maybe not every, but <laughs> many nuggets of like feedback and intuition. And then there are other times where I just want to be, oh, that was great. Yeah, <laughs> well, like, me too. I think everyone probably has that rise and fall of, I don't know if it's just confidence yeah. or uh, an assortment of things. But if, you know, that That's Susan Messing thing, if, if you're not having fun, you're the asshole. And more and more, I'm like, oh, no, that's e a much bigger factor than these rules. Yeah. You know, these yeah. are not, not really rules, but that we call rules. So how do we get that communication between the teacher and the student so that, I don't know, I'm just interested in that communication of how, how yeah. the student communicates that to the teacher and how the teacher, I don't know. I don't know. I don't know if it's that. I think it's more intuitive. Yeah. I think I might ask that question, yeah. but I have to figure out. What, what's really going on? Right, yeah, um, yeah, yeah. And the more you know someone, I think it's much easier yeah. to figure that stuff out. And with your with your show buddies as well, like uh, a while ago, Mayday stopped giving each other individual feedback, really. Or if we do, we find a way of kind of doing it on mass or as yeah. as a sort of. In fact, we had um, Bill Arnett in January. He's a great teacher from Chicago, and he got us all to sort of do feedback for each other and then just give it to him right. so we didn't see what other people thought. And it wasn't like, what yeah. is this person shit at? It was like, <laughs> what I love about what they do and yeah. what I like to see them do more of yeah. or whatever. But um, yeah, I think like the Maydays and other people that I think are my peers, uh, it is very much like we can't criticise each other's work because it just depends on the show we're in. Yeah. So you can only say, what you're doing fits with this or what you're doing doesn't fit with this and you can only do that if you're directing the show otherwise yeah. shut up <laughs> <laughs> yeah and i i think that is um but i sometimes I, I agree with the the idea of having the feedback and sort of giving it to the group rather than to necessarily the individual person but yeah. is the person that's at fault of doing that thing necessarily going to notice yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, you know i think you see how bulletproof <laughs> people are or not as yeah. well and people that you need to give huge notes to like you, you're not giving a shit about your partner or, oh my God, please listen. <laughs> this is the language I use when I teach. <laughs> it's what I'm thinking. Um, those people tend to be more bulletproof in a way. Yes. Because they are a little bit less aware of other people and what's going on. So you can be like, mate, just fucking listen. Look, she said words. And they'll be like, okay. You know, and if you said that to someone who's more nuanced and subtle, you, well, you wouldn't need to for a start. But then they'd be like, oh, oh God, okay. And then have a crisis about not listening. But, so it's, it's a level, isn't it? Yeah, I think it's intuitive. And the more you teach, I think the more aware you become. I mean, it's hard enough teaching things anyway, but then having to be intuitive <laughs> at the same time. Yeah. How is that? <laughs> I mean, there's a lot of stories about like teachers that come to town and make everyone cry and about clowning classes and stuff yeah. where everyone's like oh it's broken and now I don't now want to be broken I don't know I don't know how valid that is I kind of think if you have to make someone cry before they realise something maybe you should <laughs> teach her <laughs> but maybe that's my own you know fears and shit I'm not sure but I think they I don't know I think that's much. a bit much <laughs> Well, yeah, yeah, I think it is a bit much. I mean, I haven't done clowning and I've talked about it a lot on this podcast and I am going to have to do it because I'm just talking about it from a position of ignorance. Yeah, and lots of people true. have said, oh, it's amazing. But yeah, I don't really want to be broken down and built up again. But once someone has made you cry and shit in the woods or whatever the stories <laughs> are, then you can't say it was crap, can you? Because you've, you've 
uh, gone out there and you've emotionally invested. It's like a, right. it's like an abusive relationship. Or something. It's like, no, he definitely loves me because he punched me in the face. That's what it sounds like to me. This is all <laughs> ridiculous. I'm not sure how much I believe that. I'm just enjoying talking about it in this way. Um, but I don't know. I I like to I like to take care of people and know that most most people are just doing it for fun. Yeah. Right. I mean, maybe it's different if it's like your career and you want to accelerate it, so you want to work so hard that it ruins you psychologically <laughs> then that's fine isn't it I'm not sure I want to do that personally, or inflict that on other people <laughs> this, went a, this went a weird route <laughs> <laughs> oh, I spend an inordinate amount of time on this podcast laughing I do realise that <laughs> that's good well, that's brilliant so otherwise like... why would you do it should I try and make you cry yes. before the end of the podcast just break me down and build me up in the next three quarters of an hour <laughs> But no, I'll tell everyone, no, it was really good. Yeah, I was really, you know... <laughs> I'm emotionally invested in yeah. it. It's really helped me podcast. <laughs> if it gets me more listeners, that's yeah. fine. Uh, <laughs> Probably would. In the American spirit of pod- honest podcasting. Honest we'll, podcast. we'll mark Marin it. That'd be amazing. <laughs> um, so, uh, let's turn back the clock. Okay. Let's travel back in time, as it were. <laughs> yeah. When... Or how or what did you start performing? Um, I guess I could tell you about improv. There's like a bunch of different starts. I'll try and be as efficient as I can. <laughs> I, uh, it's interesting because people do go, when did you start improv? And it's not quite, it's not as black and white as that for me. I didn't never do any theatre and then suddenly go to a class or a show or something. So um, I, I remember doing uh, drama classes when I was at school, so like pre-GCSE and GCSE, Um, and my teacher was Mrs. Smith, and I'm pretty sure she didn't give a shit about any kind of lesson plans, which is fine, because she's a drama teacher and no one cared in the 90s, Um, and she would wear slippers to work and like huge cardigans, like a like an absolute stereotype acting lady. <laughs> I imagine she was really old, but she was probably like 25, wasn't she? <laughs> um, and uh, yeah, so she, I remember her doing a lot of short form games with us in retrospect. I didn't know what they were, yeah. whose line wasn't, uh, I wasn't aware of it at that time, although it was probably on. Um, and in fact, I was, I was very sort of well behaved at school, but I actually used to, uh, year was split into two. And I used to skip my English lessons to go to the other year half's drama lessons. Because <laughs> I was having such a great time. And no one complained. Like the, the uh, Phil something, I can't remember his name. Anyway, the, the English teacher didn't care. He was phoning it in anyway. Yeah. Yeah, I think he was covering for someone and showing people videos of, you know, Blackadder or something. <laughs> <laughs> Whatever the English equivalent is of lazy go-to GCSE videos. Um, yeah, so she didn't really care. And a lot of my mates were in the other year half. So, yeah, I don't know if that happened once or like 10 times. I've imagined it happened for like three years. It probably wasn't that much. So that introduced me to it. And I was pretty, uh, you know, I didn't like school very much. And I had very a couple sort of really niche friends and that was it. And everyone else and I got bullied a lot. Oh, wow, story of an improviser. <laughs> um, yeah. But that's when I felt like I could say what I thought and have a fun time and, uh, and control when people were laughing at me rather than just deal with it. Um, so there was that. But we had terrible school plays, man. Just awful. They were crap. So many people were like, we did Bugsy Malone. It was so much fun. No, all my experience of school plays was... Uh, teachers really badly rewriting existing shows and musicals really? so they didn't have to pay 200 quid in show fees. So we like did <laughs> The Family Von Trapp, the worst musical you can imagine. So I know songs from The Family Von Trapp and not from The Sound of Music. They were so bad. We all had the same names. It was the same storyline, but they'd written a lot of terrible songs. And then, the same, and then I changed schools and the same thing happened where it was just like teachers writing plays and making the kids be in them. Oh, and they were all so bad. <laughs> and I was too kind of, I don't know, scared, but not scared of doing plays, but scared of meeting new people. So I never went to like an after school kind of drama club or anything. I should have done, but I just, you know, I didn't. <laughs> Great. Uh, <laughs> but then I, I did enjoy that. So I, you know, my A-levels and, and, uh, and drama, I did a drama degree. So then I was 
trained. And there's always aspects of improvisation that go through that stuff. So when you learn about Brecht and Stanislavski and all the kind of big theatre practitioners, there's always a wing of their teaching that is improv. Um, so, like, I remember doing a Stanislavski exercise in my A-levels. I don't know if they still do it now. But um, we went into the class and our teacher was like, guys, before we start class, I've lost an earring. It's really valuable. Can we just spend... Can we just look for it and you know backstory of sentimental value and stuff so the whole class went looking for an earring you know kind of upturning everything trying to look behind everything and then after sort of i don't know it felt like ages she was like okay guys i haven't lost an earring now i want you to pretend that i have and now go do exactly what you did before where you know what was your what did you physically do? What was your emotional state? Can you recreate that in a believable way? Yeah. So we'd try and do it again. And she's like, okay, cool. So this is sort of, we're, we're trying to create realism through improv, but through having experienced something for reals. Um, and there's a load of other Stanislavski stuff, like you kind of, you, you pick a story and then you uh, try and tell two other stories that are lies and, and see how you can tell whether people are kind of lying or not, or right. what is it? It's often in the specifics and how confident they look with telling it, and all that kind of stuff. So, the Stanislavski stuff, and then a bunch of Brecht, too. So, and then going to university, it was more like we used improv for devising, so to create work. Not that you'd always come to a class with a script. It would be more like, okay, we're going to work on these themes. So you would just mess around and try and create uh, characters or scenes or hot seat characters for, for acting stuff, um, yeah, as, as a writing process. But I'd never done performance improv um, until my 20s, really, I don't think. Yeah, so I'd always used it as a tool since I was a kid. But I think I was, um, I was doing plays and things and writing. And then, uh, yeah, and then properly uh, I went to a May Day's drop-in class. Because I was actually thinking of teaching improv in Brighton, where I was living after university. Um, to, to help people learn about practitioners, because I always think that's an interesting way, like a paperless learn about stuff thing, because not everyone is into bookish stuff. Um, or for me, I'd rather look at the bookish stuff afterwards. I want to have an experiential learning thing, because right. I'm quite kinesthetic in that way. And then later read up about it and have a hook into it and know like yes. what's going on. And like, oh, cool, yeah, yeah, I get it. And then I want to know more about it. Um, but then I went to Maydays because I was like, well, I should brush up, because I haven't done the improv for a while, so it'd be stupid to teach and not and not be on it uh, so I met John Creamer and then uh, basically joined the Meadows for like 12 years uh, let's cut a story short uh, and really briefly uh, in 2005 so Rachel Blackman my original Tupov partner who, who was also a Mayday at the time uh, she's really uh, amazing she's incredible she's one of the most incredible people I've ever worked with and she was like well if we're going to be good at improv we have to go to the best place in the world and learn so she taught me into going to Chicago and we went to Second City first for an intensive and then while we were there we were watching I.O. up the road and going oh, well Second City's cool uh, I.O. so then um, saved up and went back there and did the intensive in 2008 and then continued long form so yeah, there you go that's the abridged, the abridged history sounds good okay. hooray <laughs> hooray yeah so that's how I got involved. But other, other stuff is just because I did drama at university, so the, the writing and performing stuff. I didn't really do a lot of performing until uh, my mid-twenties, I guess, really. I, w I never started off going, I want to be an actor. I think I, my dad uh, writes kids' books, so I think I always felt like I was a writer because of him. Right. I've never written a book. I can't, I really don't know how anyone writes a book. It seems like a lot of time and effort. <laughs> so I did write plays and sketches and things all the time. Yeah. So that's that angle. Brilliant, <laughs> yeah. brilliant. Um, right, I've written a list of things. Oh my goodness. A list of things. Okay. In no particular order. Yeah. Um, <laughs> this is good. It's got like a sh new shirt. <laughs> um, no, no, wait, that's my shopping list. Yeah. Oh, wrong one, wrong one, wrong one. You've got a podcast. I have. Tell us about your podcast. Okay, so um, me and my husband wanted to have a, an improv project together, and it was his idea in the first place of doing 
It's called Destination. Find it at destinationpod.co.uk or on iTunes. <laughs> um, we've made uh, 32 episodes now. Well, actually, we've made more than that, but that's how many are out. Uh, yeah, and he had an idea of, uh, vaguely of the form, and then we just collaborated on it, and we had a, a few goes and tweaked it a bunch. So then we have, like, uh, a pool of other actors, the seven other people who are kind of in our regulars list <laughs> and we just kind of email them all and go who's around and have three or four people in the show and then we often use guests and stuff as well so if there's someone in town or we just fancy playing with someone and we don't get to play with them they end up being a guest we've recently um recorded episodes with uh, jill bernard next season so that's fun and eric her partner who's also awesome i met in texas uh yeah and we've got do not adjust your stage we're going to do a special but yeah, it's cool. Like in the, we were going to America on a on a jolly last year, so we were like, oh cool. Well, let's let's take our recording equipment with us because that's a great way of getting through customs without being asked questions. <laughs> um, <laughs> uh, but we were fine. It's good. Uh, and then yeah, so we got to sound fancy by recording stuff in like um, Texas and and. Um, New York and Chicago with amazing people because I emailed friends and went, hey, we're doing this. Yeah, which is really nice. So, uh, yeah, I love that podcast. It's really good. And it's kind of nice. It, well, it's very nice to have a project that I can do with my partner. That's pretty cool. And it's not, it's not really trying to... Uh, we don't have a, a particular plan for it. It's just a really nice thing to do. Right. Um, I mean, we're talking to people and advertisers and all that kind of stuff. But to some extent, we're like, yeah, we don't really want ads in it at yeah. the moment. Like, it's quite nice to just have a cool little story. So it started as, as an experiment. In fact, the pilot is there if you look through the list of episodes, which was just us going, all right, here's how we think it'll work, you guys. Here are some signals we can use. <laughs> um, and the concept is? The concept is... Uh, well, you have to listen. <laughs> <laughs> but the concept is that there's one person alone in a car, and that's what happens. And it's real time. It's kind of like a mono scene, I guess. So there's one person in a car. They're given the destination is the call out from Twitter or Facebook or whoever, or, or from a live audience. And then that person just drives there. It's a round table podcast, or it's done on stage. And then everyone else, no, they never stop the car, no one gets in or out of the car, and the last thing that happens is they reach their destination. Uh, it doesn't have to be a narrative, it sometimes is, but it doesn't matter. And there's no particular style either, it just depends who we're playing with. So we're like, it's fine if it's comedy, or it's, it's intense, or it's sci-fi, or it's normal, like, whatever, it's fine. <laughs> uh, yeah, and then people call the driver, or they end up being sort of hallucinations by the driver sometimes, and that's it. That's just what happens. So yeah. it, it often escalates a little bit like they'll get a few foundational kind of phone calls so we'll understand what kind of person they are it's like a scene hall really but with phone calls if you've ever done the exercise um, i haven't heard a scene hall work kind of the same so you have one person who is on stage the whole time and then other people tag in the second character to be other people within uh, their life right, so you yes. basically if no, you I, had the scene I didn't realize hall, it was called that cool yeah so you find out all yeah. about your character right through other people Right. So it's a bit like that. You, you get endowed a lot because you learn why are these people calling you and what's their attitude to you. Therefore, you must be this sort of person with this point of view. So by the end of 15 minutes, we've hopefully worked out kind of what sort of person they are and it's a discovery. And uh, yeah, so that's it. That's cool. the destination. And you mentioned the mono scene. What's, what's a mono scene? A uh, mono scene is just uh, improv tech speak for one scene doesn't really cut away it's like takes it's like a bottle episode of a sitcom so it just takes place in one location really. so people can the the way you edit a mono scene is by coming in and, in and out of it oh. so any other action would take place off stage or right. i think you can have uh time jumps in a mono scene i'm not entirely sure <laughs> technically whether you're allowed but uh yeah it's one place i think and i think it's mostly linear anyway yeah there you go nerd 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 out that's good that's what <laughs> that's what that's what the, uh, the listeners want I hope listeners write in and correct me about Monocy. <laughs> That'd be great. I re Bill taught me a really cool, Bill Arnett taught me a really cool form uh, in January called Detours, which is amazing. It's really cool. You just do one scene over and over and over and over and over again, right. the same scene. Yeah. And then you start picking up on all the little subtle things that are different. Right. Uh, so I taught it to me and Chris's forms class. And then I, and I'd email Bill going, oh yeah, you know, send me stuff about it. 
And then I got his stuff and I was like, yep, taught that wrong. <laughs> <laughs> oh well. <laughs> we, we made some cool discoveries though. <laughs> um, incidentally, I did send them all the paperwork. I was like, okay, cool. Choose which one's best, guys. Which one's best? Me or the international amazing teacher? <laughs> so yeah, it's good form. Check it out. <laughs> what way did you teach it wrong? Oh, it's just like, again, it's really nerdy. But only nerds listen to this. I don't exactly. want to apologise for it. Um, <laughs> I only want Some builder nerds. like, oh, what should I listen to today? <laughs> oh, I don't know. Uh, this looks like <laughs> from London. Yeah. Uh, so, what did I get wrong? I, I think, um, so detours, yeah, you just play the same scene over and over again. And I was like, hey, why not? You could probably map it onto another scene that has exactly the same dialogue. Or you could go slightly before or slightly after. Or you could have a, walk, you could have a couple walk-ons if it, it fitted the parallel universe that you're kind of playing this time. <laughs> no, no, you can't. <laughs> uh, <laughs> that's wrong. <laughs> um, but I think... But we might have discovered a fun form that's somewhere between a deconstruction and detours. So that's fun. That's the good thing about a forms class is that we are experimenting. And there's no way you can teach any form properly in two and a half hours. So me and Chris sort of throw them, throw a bunch of ideas at these amazing improvisers and they deal with it. You know, and week to week it's like one week they're doing a heavy premise driven form which is like really snappy and you better be funny right now and don't come on unless you've got an idea and the next week it's like no it's super organic you guys don't you dare have an idea you better just look at the other person and get some subtext <laughs> you know and they cope with that which i think is pretty great um is this the hoopla this is the hoopla forms class yeah because yeah. there's there's more levels than there used to be yeah so that and there's another one in may i think i'm teaching an advanced long form which is sort of hot um, the, the new version of that. So that's an experiment, as Chris kind of discussed. Um, and, and the next one is going to be more like, okay, cool, so we do advanced long form and, if, uh, and we can go down any rabbit hole of any form that seems to seem relevant at the time or stick. So it's not necessarily like a form every week. It's more yeah. like, oh, what are these, what works for these people and yeah. maybe we should learn this for a week. It's a bit looser, but the same sort of idea. Yeah. Cool, cool. Um, yes, uh, you mentioned science fiction. Yay! <laughs> or should I say SF? You should. I should. Yeah, nerdy, nerdy times. <laughs> uh, yes, well, well uh, one aspect of your love of SF is Project 2. It is, yeah, yeah, yeah. I uh, mean... How would you rate the quality <laughs> of Project 2? <laughs> oh, what was Chris's exact quote? Um, Oh, what did he say? Were they uh, legitimately all right? Legitimately all right. All right. Yeah, I questioned him on it. Uh, basically, me and John have been taking the piss out of Chris ever since then, by quoting it everywhere we can. At the end of long text conversations as well, we're, uh, what should we put on the poster? And then we'd be like, yeah, legitimately all right? At the end of like 10 possibilities. Anyway. <laughs> but uh, I think he was going to say legitimately awesome and then bail. So I like to believe. <laughs> yeah, that's true. Uh, yeah, so a legitimately all right improv group. Um, it's weird, actually. Our shows have been quite random recently. What were you asking me? Because I was just about to ramble on about how our shows are. That's pretty much what I was asking okay. you. Okay. It's good. We're working on a new show at the moment. Every time you work on a new show, it kind of messes with everything you do. <laughs> <laughs> so we're, we're working on... Um, it's a... It's got aspects of like the movie, Anthony and Tamanik's movie, and stuff like that. But also, we're um, the byproduct is we're sort of creating our own edits and stuff around it, and a new form. So that's quite interesting. It's mainly for the nursery, and then we're taking it to Brighton Fringe. So it's just improvised sci-fi movie or film. And so rather than it just being a gen generic sci-fi thing, we're trying to make it feel a bit more cinematic. Right. Um, partly because the Edric is such a lovely place to yes. do to use tech properly. Yes. Um, and it's got a lot of space, and we have you know a long enough set to be able to get into something that feels more filmic than say a half hour set or whatever. Yeah. Um, unless you're doing the Kubrick. Yeah, unless you're doing the Kubrick. Oh, everything has to be there. Then we have to get that gate or... made. Um, do you know what? That's eyes wide shut. I think where. <laughs> People brought him loads and loads of pictures of gates, and he was like, nope, 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 nope. And then, uh, 
And I was like, no, uh, I want this one. And like drew it and went, well, you have to make it then if you can't find it. <laughs> yeah, he's crazy. For like, you know, a two second, if that short of a gate. I was thinking... Well done, Stanley. <laughs> Good work. Yeah, I was thinking about 2001 and um, uh, I've generally been watching the films uh, that uh, they've been covering on Classics Massive. Oh, cool, uh, yeah. I decided I wouldn't re-watch 2001. <laughs> oh, oh. Oh, what's going to do with that is watch the opening with a different soundtrack. Oh, right. Stick any other music on it. It's quite cool. <laughs> because that's what they did. Um, right, yeah, yes. they just, and when they got to that track, they were like, oh man, this is amazing. But they tried loads of other stuff. Right. So, okay. Trying to amuse yourself for half an hour. <laughs> try other music over time. If you like the Birdie song or something, see how profound it is there. Um, yeah. Uh, so, what was I talking about? Project 2 in general. Yeah, anyway, so we're working on things, and that's interesting. It's great. We've got rehearsal once a week, which is really great uh, and we're working on legitimately great it's legitimately all right yeah uh, well, it's been interesting though we because i think we're working on something and changing our process a little bit um, and digging into one thing or another our shows have been more variable than normal yeah. so we've had a couple that are, um well one that i wasn't happy with and wrote a big blog about because i was pretty annoyed about it I was going to pretend it wasn't Project 2, but it's out there, guys. <laughs> but I think John basically shared it and went, guess who this is about? <laughs> uh, so, you know, everyone knows and no one cares. Uh, yeah, and that was weird. So, uh, but then we've also had some great shows. Like, a, we really enjoyed the one we did at Geek Easy. Um, and Hollow Deck was all right. So it's just more, more variable, I think, while we're... Um, connecting in a different way or trying different edits and experiments and stuff like that. And playing a lot more different venues, I think, as well, because we're kind of, um, like, we're at Free Association soon, but we were doing Shoreditch and the Miller and other things. So we're here and there, I don't know. And while you're planning a, a show for a really big space, and then you're sort of for, for like 45 or an hour, yeah. and then your next show is 15 minutes yeah. or half an hour at a, a tiny stage that you've never been on before, it's like, messes with your head. <laughs> So, but it's good, yeah. So, um, how does a project two rehearsal work then? Uh, Who's always late? Uh, <laughs> who wants to chat more than rehearse? Oh, we have a we have a system. So everyone's pretty much on time because everyone's really. It's a Monday morning, by the way. Wow, that is our Monday morning. That is, that it's pretty is, good. That's hardcore. That's a pretty good beginning yes. of the week. Uh, and May days are on Mondays as well, so that's seven and a half hours of improv right there on a wow. Monday. <laughs> um, if I don't have anything between, which I sometimes do. Yeah, I mean, Chris had a 12 hour improv day recently. Whoa. Which is not normal. <laughs> um, but uh, how does it work? Well, we had, a, I think, a two dayer to get us right back into it, probably at the end of last year sometime. And we made like an agenda, like a proper agenda of like, this 15 minutes is talking, this hour is, um, you know, emotional work. This hour is just like touching each other. <laughs> this hour is, uh, you know, messing with time. This hour is just, we all put our favorite exercises in a hat and then we pull them out at random and just do them because improv's fun and we all want to do our favorite stuff. We ended up doing short form that weekend <laughs> just for like, I don't know, a bit. Um, and then bringing in cool exercises that we learned from teachers and stuff. So that kind of kick-started the new, the new period. And we have, so when we teach, we have four areas that we work in. We do uh, time, space, humans, and form. So time is pretty obvious, I think, where you might cut forward or backward in time, whether it's a short amount of time or long, and you know how you use tag outs and how to kind of hang on to and remember the timeline that you've created so that you can move fluidly through it without completely messing up your head. Um, space is like quite a lot of things. It's literally the staging, it can be scene painting, that can also be about edits. It can be, yeah, object work. There's quite a lot in space. And how to use the stage creatively rather than just being two talking heads. Um, there's humans, which is all that um, the kind of silence and subtext work that I teach and that Chris has been doing with emotion play. Um, so that is very much what's going on right here, right now. Uh, how can we use what the feeling already is, kind of TJ and Dave type stuff. Um, and what we're trying to push in terms of our style at the moment. Um, and then there's forms, which is literally like, what form do you want to do? How does it work? How do we arrive at it? 
So it's not by accident that we want to teach those things. It's because we want to work on all those areas and make them awesome. Right. And because they sound quite scientific. <laughs> uh, or, or SF, I guess. <laughs> um, so we do the... We either pick one of those to work on that week. Um, in terms of how much we talk, we actually all just want to geek out about stuff and talk about all the cool things we've seen recently or read or comic books or films or whatever. So we make one of us in charge of any period of time. And they're basically just the person that goes, all right, come on, guys, let's do some work. Wow. That's it. So, like, you know, the first 45 minutes might be me, and then it's Chris, and then it's John. And we just decide at the beginning of the day, like, what do we need to work on? So uh, this week was, like, we spent 45 minutes on how is the opening going to work, because we're going to use some tech, and there's different ways of getting suggestions and all this kind of stuff. And then uh, working on the form for 45 minutes, um, and then we did something called scene study, which I um, learned from Craig Kikowski, who's from LA, but I was in Texas and he was teaching a class there and it's like so amazing. So we just did a load of scene study stuff, which is basically imagining that your scene is, it's from a play that's already, already been written. It has blocking. You've been blocked. So every time you move, you feel like it's for a reason. I know why I'm walking here. My director has told me to walk here. Oh, right. The script is written. So I know what I'm going to say, so I don't need to worry about it. I know my lines, I'm good. Everything I say has a reason and a function. Even if I don't know what it is right now, yeah. it's, it's been written, so it's taken care of. And it's always act two of a play. So you're never setting anything up, and right. you're never finishing anything. Nice, yeah. It's literally just that. And the way you do it as an exercise is the director will just be like, okay, let's see the, the railway scene from Missing Marcy. So you get like a location and then you get the title of a show. And it immediately gives you a feeling of what that might be like if you watched it on Broadway or yeah. the West End or Broadway or, or wherever. You, you get a sense of how, how to play and what to do. We never in, and whenever I've done that with a class as well, people don't interrupt each other. Yeah. The blocking is incredible. Yeah. Like People make really awesome decisions about where to stand, what to do, where to go. Yeah. There's a lot more silence. People let each other monologue. They listen much better. It's incredible. And it's yeah. just a couple of directions. It's like, oh, hey, nice. bear these things in mind. Now I improvise. But they, it's incredible. The change is insane. Yeah. So we're like, okay, well, we're just doing that with our work. That's yeah. the main body of our work. Um, yeah, I recommend trying it. It's, it's really, really interesting. Cool. I can just sort of feel, even just you describing it to me, it feels quite powerful. And yeah, as if everything is sorted out. I don't know, there's no need to worry and you're just doing a thing that already... Yeah, that's amazing. And it is a bit TJ and Dave as well because they say they are the story already exists yeah. and they're just we just get to see these people for this period of time, right? They kind yeah. of inhabit them, but after the show, their lives, uh, on, yeah. their lives of the yeah, characters yeah, continue yeah. and they've happened before, so they're just trying to get the signals of, okay, well, what was already happening? Yeah. It's, the same, it's all the same thing, but that, that's been a really effective way in and yeah. a shorthand to just go, okay, cool, um, I'm not inventing, it's done. Yes, yes. Um, and I think sometimes we phrase that a difficult way around, like we're, we say, okay, just um, always act like you know what's going on, or uh, don't do apology face, don't yeah. look like, ah, sorry, I fucked up this song, or whatever. Yeah. When really, I wonder if it's a change in language for teachers and directors and coaches. That yeah. I, I'm trying to do of just like cool, you know what it is. This yeah. is awesome. Uh, rather than don't do this because it sets you up like oh I, I'm messing it up. Rather than oh it's, I've got it. It's cool. Yeah, it's interesting. Cool. CBT or something. <laughs> yeah. um, cool. And you mentioned Geek Easy. Yeah, so that's Project Two's comedy night for nerds. Right. So we do that pretty much once a month at the Miller, and it's a Friday night show. And it's not, uh, we do improv, but we host a bunch of other things. So we, we pick a, a theme. So the last one's indie movies. We've also done like comic books and uh, 80s films and God, I don't know, so many things. Apocalypse. <laughs> uh, we just pick something. The way we pick themes, by the way, is we all write down as many themes as we can think of. And then we just read them all out. And everything we all are excited about, we put tick by. Yeah. And if just two of us are excited about something, we cross it off. Really? And it's always been exactly the right amount of themes. Wow. Um, and that's it. Great process. It's the um, classic, classic smashing process. <laughs> yeah, it is. There you go. It's the same voting system. <laughs> um, so, yeah, the next one is robots. Robots. Yeah. 
Uh, and then we'll look around and at our amazing comedian friends and improviser friends and storytelling friends or whatever, anyone that we know who's interesting and might be good for comedy for nerds, uh, who has something in that niche, and we'll just book them. Cool. So we had Richard Sandling on at the Indie Movies thing, who's a total movie nut and a stand-up, so he was a no-brainer. can't believe he did it. He's way out of our league. <laughs> we didn't pay him very much. <laughs> anyway, he was great. Um, and that's it, really. So that's always a fun night. And it's, and it's not exclusive. It's not just an improv night. Yes. So I think it, it's a bit broader that anyone can come and right. just enjoy it, uh, particularly if they like that subject. But we did have people come to like the Crystal Maze one who'd never seen the Crystal Maze. <laughs> and they're like, okay, a lot of this might be really dull for you. Um, and we ended up just explaining how the Crystal Maze worked. You see, I wonder... But they had a fun time. I wonder if you'd never seen the Crystal Maze, and if you saw a show about it, mm-hmm. would it not sound the most amazing thing? Because <laughs> you'd be, like, piecing together the clues and then, like, creating yeah. the same thing in your mind. I really like nerd comedy, even when I don't know what it's about. Yeah. You know when someone geeks out about a book or something you haven't read or, or whatever? Like, Josie, Josie Long is a good person that does that she'll do one joke that one person in the audience will just <laughs> yeah, die yeah, laughing yeah, at yeah, yeah. and I like hearing it because the, the rhythm and the construction of it is amazing yes. and it makes you laugh anyway but then you're like what if I'd even know what she was talking about <laughs> that would be the best book that would be the best joke ever so I do like that stuff I like it when it's niche and, and it also can pique your interest about something right also yes. if you see something nerdy um, Ben Stevens did a lovely bit at the last Geek Easy about Sorry, um, <laughs> just want to oh, say we're in a dance class, you guys. Just so you know. <laughs> Do you want to say that? <laughs> Tell me that bit again. <laughs> uh, yeah, I was just saying, Ben Stevens at our indie night thing, indie movies, talked about um, David Lynch for like 10 minutes. And we weren't like, write a comedy routine about it. We're just interested. So not everything has to be like gags. Yeah. Um, people bring new ideas or new material if, we're, if they're like a, a comic or just someone interesting that we want to hear about. And we just book them. It's basically we put on people that we want to see. Brilliant. And then they do it. It's good. So is it, is it the specificity of the nerd humour? Is it the passion? I think it's all of those things. It would be really pointless to do a nerd night about something you're not interested in. Hmm. Because I think that's it. Is we get there and we're already really excited about all the people that we've booked that we, we get to watch. Yeah. And then when other people come, it's like, this is insane. <laughs> How cool. Um, so yeah, I think we're all, we all genuinely are really excited about everything. Like when we did comic books, which I think was one of our first ones, I didn't know that much about comic books. I'd read a few like Saga and Sex Criminals and like a few like that that are kind of quite famous in that uh, niche. Um, and now I do and now I do and I'm into them so we, there is a sharing type thing right. that goes on between us as friends where we catch up on each other's nerdy stuff and go oh I'm really into this or I'm not um, Chris is heavily into Doctor Who uh, John loves Blade Runner and Alien more than anything you know that kind of thing so we all have our particular fields of stuff that we may or may not be into but I think that's good on stage because something that I might have watched a lot of and maybe they haven't you know we, one of us has always got some in-depth knowledge about something and the other two are playing, playing catch-up yeah. or, or just improvising around it. Yes. And if everyone knew everything about yes. one particular reference, you'd, um, you'd ignore the, you'd cut the audience yeah. out. So it's kind of good when one of us is really into something and the other two are like, yeah, it's all right, it's cool, I like it, yeah, sure, whatever. Um, um, yes, yeah, so I've experienced a similar thing, especially when you're improvising with people um, who've come from other countries and... Um, uh, it was a hoopla thing, mm. and we were improvising. I think we were improvising a Carry On film or something like yeah. that. And it's like even afterwards, we couldn't really explain why, <laughs> what. I don't. These are the things. It's hard to explain, but just seeing them uh, improvising off the people that did know what they were doing, right. and the, you know, and then seeing their version, their version of it, because they were mirroring what we were doing. I think was just you know. Yeah, that's brilliant. <laughs> it's delightful. It. <laughs> yeah, that's cool. And there's also. Holodeck. So Holodeck is our, so if Geek Easy is a, anyone can come and see it, it's a comedy night. Holodeck is a, probably you want to be an improviser, otherwise <laughs> it's a, why are you here? Uh, they're very welcome, but I don't know if I want to watch a jam night if I wasn't an improviser. Uh, so yeah, Holodeck is a jam night for, for everyone. So, um, and the reason it's Holodeck is because of TNG, I mean Star Trek, The Next Generation. Um, where there's a room 
where anything can happen. It's, <laughs> a, it's a room that looks like a, uh, a 3D grid, and people go in there for their downtime on a spaceship where there's nothing else to do. It's like their recreational time. So if you imagine something, it happens. Um, and it breaks. Yeah, it breaks, <laughs> and everything goes weird, and they do a really strange um, Robin of Sherwood episode <laughs> that everyone should think about. Um, <laughs> Yeah, so for us it's science fiction, but for anyone that plays in it, it's like, you, you don't have to be science fiction. We, that, that's already a framing device for you being able to do what you want, and we quite like putting yellow LX all over the miller, because it looks cool. Um, yeah, and then we have teams come do 10 minutes, either they're new or they just want to play because they want some more stage time, and then uh, other people just put their hands up. We do short form, we do long form, just and everything's about 10 minutes long, and Project 2 does a little set. That's it, yeah. Well, well, like, relaxed and good fun, yeah. Sounds brilliant. This is a hangout for yeah. improvisers, basically. Yeah. Um, cool. And um, uh, you're also involved in Nightmare Live. Yeah. This sounds really exciting. <laughs> oh, it's amazing. I, I, so it's the third iteration of Nightmare Live. And um, I watched the first one. I used to watch Nightmare when I was a kid, yes, obviously. Yes, I did. Um, and I loved it so much, and I applied for it, and I didn't, and I didn't have a photo, so I was like, oh, I've messed it up, because I didn't, you're like, I don't know, went to the, at that point, for some reason it was hard finding a headshot, I don't know why, <laughs> but I didn't get on it, and I was like, mortified, and um, did you ever apply for it? No, I didn't, no. I didn't ever occur to me that there was something that I could be on. Yeah, I didn't really have enough nerdy friends honestly as well. Is that, is that I don't, I mean, I'm sure I applied with other people, but I I imagine they didn't care. I tried to do. I tried to run a like a D and D game at school once. I got. Um, do you remember Fright, Fighting Fantasy with Peter yeah. Jackson and Livingston? Yeah, yeah, yeah. I bought the Riddler, which is basically like uh, a games master's guide to running a game. And I couldn't get anyone to do it with me. It's like, oh, man, one day I'll know a load of nerds. Ta-da! <laughs> and I can do D and D whenever I want. Um, uh, yeah, can't remember what I was talking about. That. Why was I talking about that? Um, because we're talking about Nightmare Live and oh, yeah, uh, that's right. the <laughs> Dungeon crawling, that's how I got there. <laughs> oh yeah, so I watched it the first year and it was the best show ever and amazing and so cool. It was so cool and really funny uh, and amazing. And then the second year, uh, I basically constantly emailed Paul Flannery, who I didn't know. <laughs> because Paul Foxcrossed, I think, gave me his contact or I just kept hitting him up on Facebook and going, Paul, you have to tell him I'm all right. <laughs> and then after constantly pestering him, I got to be on the team. So you have like two comics basically being being the team that you would normally have. Uh, and then an audience member is the Dungeoneer wearing the helmet of justice and having their journey. Um, and this guy, the guy I was doing it with, was doing a, an amazing job of being a really good stand-up. He was kind of being really funny and kind of taking the piss out of everything, which is great. And that's kind of what they want. And Paul's being tray guard and keeping everything great. And then I was just, but I just cared so much. Like, I thought, yeah, I'll be on the panel and then just be funny. But I was just, like, obsessed with wanting to... I killed the guy. It was terrible. I killed the dungeoneer. Um, but I was like, you know how tense you get when, they, when you want them to sidestep somewhere? Yeah, yeah, I was yeah. like, oh, God! Oh, oh. I made him, the other guy, do, like, most of the <laughs> controlling. And right at the end, he was like, okay, you can do the controlling the person. And I was like, oh, shit. <laughs> Um, but yeah, I had the best time, and there's a hilarious photo of me being like, <laughs> the best time ever. Um, and then Paul, uh, Paul Flannery came and did uh, one of our geek easies, actually. We had a, like, I can't remember what it was. It might have been Game of Thrones or Dungeons and Dragons. I actually forget which one it was. Uh, but he came and did some stand-up in character. I can't remember. I think he was like, he was some kind of character from... D and D doing a stand up routine, which was amazing. <laughs> um, and yeah, we hung out, and I got to know him a bit better. And then yeah, and then he asked me to do this season. And I think um, this season is going to be more improv. So there's going to be I don't know how much am I allowed to say? You know. <laughs> um, but there's going to be more dungeoneers and more possibilities of rooms and stuff. Anyway, we haven't started rehearsing yet. What I know that I can say. There's an Indiegogo. Like, if you like Nightmare, you can you can pay. I think it's a fiver to wear the helmet of justice, or or to have the chance to. You get like a everyone who's got that puts their name in a hat, and then they 
pick out five people. You might last two minutes, or you might last the whole show. Yeah. Uh, like the TV show. Well, yeah, yeah, exactly, yeah. So that's cool. Yeah. So I'm so excited about that. That's on in Edinburgh at the Pleasance. And we're doing the uh, South Bank uh, Adderbelly Festival as well. So that'll be cool. Cool. Yeah, I'm yeah. so excited. So I'm a fangirl for the show I'm in. It's cool. <laughs> What inspired you? This isn't a big finishing question. This is just I haven't asked this. Yeah. What? Talk me through the process of creating a improv show based on Quantum Leap. <laughs> uh, well, you I were sitting Quantum at home, Leap, thought, oh, I really love Quantum Leap, <laughs> but they're not making any more. Do you know, I don't actually remember the moment when I thought I should do it. I don't, really can't remember. I that think... is because Sam Beckett had jumped into your body. There you go. <laughs> <laughs> and I was in the waiting room. Yeah, you were in the waiting room, yeah. so that's why you don't remember it. <laughs> Um, I think it was a Mayday's pitch meeting and we were all like, okay, everyone throw in what you might want to do over the next year. And I was just like, well, obviously we should improvise Quantum Leap. <laughs> I, it was probably that. Um, but it turns out uh, it's the hardest thing to improvise in a way because the rules are all anti-improv. Right. It's like, I'm, we've done it for two Edinburghs. And we're, not, we're not doing it currently, but I, I really like the show. And Jonah and Lewis were in the Edinburgh run and they're great too. Um, but, yeah, it's weird, right? So, you know, in improv, you're kind of like, okay, we know each other, we know what's going on, we know where we are, or at least we're going to work that out together. Um, or, you know, I'm an expert in this, whatever it is, it's not my first day, um, we'll figure out what the environment is. And right at the top of that show, we basically put headphones on the person that's been chosen to be Sam at random, that show, and then we get the call-outs. They don't hear the call-outs, they don't know what the year is, they don't know uh, where they are. Um, they know they're Sam Beckett, but they don't know who they've leapt into. Um, so we take the headphones off and everyone just sort of yells at them and they try and figure out what's going on. And it's against your improv instincts because you want to pretend you know what's going on until you do and yes. then, or add stuff or create things yes, with other people. but you can't because Sam can't do that. No, so you, you're still, you have to know what's going on, but you have to pretend you don't, which is the opposite of normal improv. Also... Uh, you're basically ignoring one actor for the whole show, unless you're Sam, because Al, no one can see Al, apart from you. So everyone else is ignoring one improviser <laughs> and not listening to what they say. Um, yeah, it's all crazy. It's all the wrong way around. And other things like Al can make predictions that don't come true. Right. So in normal improv, you'd be like, well, okay, well, you said that, so let's honour that story. But that's not how Quantum Leap structure works. He'll, like, he'll be like, well, I think you're here to do this, bloop, bloop, bloop. Yes. Uh, and... Basically, if he said that, you're not there for that. It's going to be whatever Sam's, you know, truthful, moralistic instincts are and whatever person he wants to help. That's where the real story is always going to be. Yes. So, again, you basically ignore Al. <laughs> but you, you have to acknowledge what he said, but not use it. Man, it's crazy. Yeah, it's, it's the most anti-improv show. So you learn a whole set of new improv rules just to do that show, I think. But it's a good learning process. And it's really fun. <laughs> yeah. Cool. Okay, so uh, last question. Mm -hmm. Last question. Um, we need a big finish, no pressure. Okay. <laughs> no pressure there. That's a lot of pressure I've to put on there. Um, uh, how, how, what would be your one, if you had to give one piece of improv advice, to improvisers, or if there's, yeah, I think I'm going to go with that, rather than if saying... give one piece of advice. Well, rather than saying, if you could change the improv scene, that sounds negative. As oh, I kind of want to answer that one. Answer that one. Because <laughs> I'm terribly negative. Um, Are you terribly negative? Uh, do you know what it is? I saw TJ and Dave was probably, uh, oh, Baby Wants Candy I saw in 99, TJ and Dave I saw in 2005. They were basically the first two long-form shows I ever saw. So now everything I watch is shit. So yeah, I'm pretty negative. Um, that's not true. But you, you get the comparison yes. that unfortunately, you know, that they're probably some of the best shows in the world. And now uh, I'm constantly going, oh, well, that's all right. <laughs> that's <laughs> legitimately. Yes, legitimately all right. All right. <laughs> uh, yeah. Um, or not. Um, so my piece of advice, I think there's definitely a huge trend in London at the moment towards premise-driven comedy improv. I have zero problem with that. I love it. I play it in a lot of shows. But 
I would love for people to always have a part of their improv open to um, the organic stuff, the organic and personal stuff, so that even if you are in a premise-driven show, you can still find time to connect with that other person and create something with them. So it's not just like, here is my whole idea for a scene. Now we play my scene. I would love to see the humanity underneath that or the working together. Because if you're just going to bring a premise and the other person's going to yes you and not and you for the whole scene, then you might as well go and write a show. What's amazing and interesting and sparky about improv for me is that it's being created in the moment. And if being created in the moment is, oh, I created it a moment ago and now I'm wheeling it on and telling you how to play it with me, I'm not so interested in that. Or if I am, I want to see the human relationship on top of that, you know? Um, so, yeah, I think emotional truth is really interesting to me. Um, my IO training gives me that thing of... Um, so, comedy is great, but when comedy fucks up... Um, there can be nothing there, or it can be awkward, or there's nothing underneath it. But if you play an amazing relationship scene and you put the comedy on top of it, if the comedy doesn't work and it falls away, you've still got a really great relationship scene, a good piece of theatre. So I think everyone should have a little corner of their improv left for good relationship scenes. Brilliant. There you go. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you very much indeed. Pleasure, man. Thank you. Great. That's fantastic. Nice I made this. That's improv! <laughs> <laughs>